welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Ancient Rainforests, Biomes of Australia, Part 1, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Nikki Centinella. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Nikki. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm joining you from the other side of the world today. Um, I am over visiting family in Belgium, but I thought I'd bring some plants in to make it feel a little bit more um, rainforesty for this talk. We're going to be exploring some of the biomes of Australia. I have a few webinars coming up over the next couple of months, and I thought it'd be interesting to break apart some of the ecosystems within Australia. We sort of talk about this giant continent uh, in pretty general terms sometimes. It seems like a world away and there's a lot going on. So I kind of want to unpack some of those things uh, and have a look at some of the rainforest specifically today that we have in Australia. Um, so here, firstly, I am Nikki. Um, you may have seen me in some of the other webinars um, and I'd love to see you down in Australia. I am Australian myself. I'm from Sydney. Uh, and I'm an expedition leader for Natural Habitat Adventures. I do the Australia South expedition um, and we'll be moving to the ultimate as well next season. And I've also done two seasons in Churchill uh, doing outdoor their season. So been around. Uh, when I'm not doing expedition leading, I am also a conservation biologist. I have a degree in first class honors in conservation biology based in Australia. And I've done a lot of field work across a lot of the country. Um, and so it's really nice to be able to have that work side, um, that really research intensive side, and then bring that to people um, and make it a bit more accessible. Uh, obviously a keen naturalist and a photographer here and there. Uh, and so as well as talking about some of the features of the rainforests and what we expect to see in Australia, I'm also going to give just a couple of brief uh, tips and tricks on how to shoot in rainforests. So generally when we're, we're looking at these darker environments, but also a really detailed, rich environment. So I'm going to talk about some of those little features there. Nothing, nothing too technical at all. I've got some examples for phone photography too. Uh, but first of all, what is a rainforest? Uh, rainforest can have a number of different definitions depending on who you ask and uh, whether you're talking to a climate scientist or uh, biologists. Um, generally, the main features of a rainforest are uh, that there is considerable rainfall. We're looking at about a minimum, usually in a tropical rainforest, of 66 inches, um, but usually averaging around 80 inches of rainfall in a year. Uh, but we're also looking at the canopy. I think this is a nice, easy way to help. And it tells us a lot about the plants that are hanging out here is uh, we have a really continuous uh, canopy cover. We're looking at about 95% coverage all the way up to 100. So if you were to stand in a rainforest and look up, uh, you're not gonna see a lot of available blue sky necessarily. Um, those leaves are gonna be crowding in and this can include multiple layers. So this will be layers down at the ground level, um, the middle, uh, and then up in the upper canopy and the emergent layer up the top there. We're also looking at epiphytes, uh, things that like to grow on other things, really. Uh, I've got some cool shots coming up of them. You can see a little bit in this background from that as well, uh, that these trees are just dusted in so many other species. We often see mosses and ferns and lichens, um, but also other entire flowering plants like bromeliads will grow on the edge of these trees, uh, creating just any opportunity to get at that limited light. Um, and obviously a lot of this uh, vegetation is moisture dependent because there is that high rainfall, it, it depends on that high rainfall and when things get dry that um, they're not likely to survive. So really things that are adapted to that wet climate. Uh, but as we have a look at some of the other types of rainforest, we actually don't just have the tropics. The tropics is the ones that we think of, they're the big ones like the Amazon um, Dane tree if you've heard in uh, Australia, which I'll dive into. Um, most of the tropical rainforests are around the equator within about 10 degrees, um, but they do extend a little bit further out. We also have the temperate rainforest, which is the main sort of general group that I'll talk about. Um, there are 
other types of rainforest, subtropical, obviously in between, and our temperate we divide into warm and cool temperate. Uh, and these temperate rainforests can be found a lot further around the world. So we see them um, in the Pacific Northwest, up into Canada in the Great Bear Rainforest, uh, but also all the way down in Southern Australia, right down to Tasmania, uh, where we see quite a different style of rainforest, which may not always uh, bring to mind the same imagery that we see uh, in other more typical tropical rainforest environments. But I will start with the tropical rainforest. Um, here you can see a nice map of where some of the tropical rainforests are located around the world. As you can see, they're within the tropics. Uh, they hold a huge uh, amount of diversity. Rainforests in general, depending on the estimate, but you're looking between 40% to 75%. So easily kind of taking the higher part of more than half of the entire world species uh, found in rain. So hugely diverse places and tropical rainforests are often attributed to be the most diverse of those. Um, when we zoom into, you can see just a tiny little speck of Australia um, right on the uh, northeast coast there. And that's where our Daintree and our wet tropics of Queensland World Heritage Area are. It's a really, really tiny portion. And so here in this area is actually the oldest rainforest in the world. This is older than the Amazon. Uh, we are looking at estimates 135 million years ago, it's pretty well established, but up to 180 million years ago. Um, so about 10 million years older than the Amazon rainforest, the oldest on earth. And before we were all split into our continents and we were all together, Australia has shifted its range across the earth. Um, its latitude has completely changed. And it used to basically, the whole continent was nearly uh, rainforest. And so it's only this small remnant that has been able to withstand over 120 million years of movement to still maintain that tropic rainforest. And so we see species that have seen ice ages, they've seen dinosaurs, um, they've seen this entire continent move across the planet. And I think that's really incredible. Um, so this is where our ultimate trip goes and our northern trip in the past year as well, um, into the Daintree in the wet tropics of Queensland. It became a World Heritage Area in 1988, and we're all glad it did. Uh, it had some really beautiful diversity, and it's got that more classic uh, tropical rainforest feel that you might expect that you'd be used to. This really dense canopy cover, these beautiful trees, we have figs and vines and um, a whole host of ferns um, absolutely littering everywhere. Um, really, really beautiful. But we do also see a host of other species. We have about 430 bird species here in the Daintree, uh, as well as basically majority of our bat and butterfly populations, we're looking at 90% of Australia's species diversity of bats and butterflies are found in this rainforest area. Uh, we also see a huge diversity of frogs. So these are some beautiful shots of some frogs up in the wet tropics uh, by other expedition leader, Matt Ponish. Um, so we have some beautiful tree frogs and we're seeing really just incredible displays of camouflage. Uh, it's a pretty busy and intense world out there, and so you've got to make sure that you can kind of get by unseen if that's something that you, you don't want to be predated upon or also just outcompeted in general. Uh, so we see 30% of Australia's frog, reptile, and marsupial species are found in the wet tropics area, which is just a huge amount of biodiversity. Here, the biodiversity as well is, is so unique because we have been separated so long as a continent. Uh, we have the most endemic primitive flowering plants competing with Madagascar and New Caledonia. So intense amount of biodiversity. And talking about Australia wouldn't be complete without some kangaroos. Uh, these guys look a little bit different. Uh, these are our tree kangaroos. They're not only found in Australia, you can find tree kangaroos further north in uh, New Guinea, uh, but we do see the beautiful Lumholtz tree kangaroo here. They're the smallest of the tree kangaroos um, and they really are very versed at hopping up and down 
the limbs of the trees. They're actually a little bit more clumsy looking on the ground. Um, so this is where we normally find them. And these are some really nice shots as well. You can see quite beautiful light. The edges of the Dane Tree Forest, we have quite a lot of larger rivers. Um, and we also border right onto the Great Barrier Reef. So we get this opportunity for light sometimes coming through that we may not see in denser um, and in our temperate rainforest, which we'll see in just this. So these are our temperate rainforests. And as you can see, they're not restricted to this tropic band. Uh, they do extend all over the world. And I quite like this map because you can kind of see how a lot of the rain shadows fall, whether it's on a coast that's getting the first weather that's coming across, or if it's being caught on a mountain range um, or the edge of the mountains and getting all of that rain shadow. So we still need a high degree of rainfall. We don't need that warm tropical weather that we associate with rain. And so the temperate rainforests produce a little bit of a different effect. Uh, we often see slightly less diversity than we do in a tropic environment. Um, and we also see slower decomposition. So often the base layer of these temperate rainforests is thicker with leaf litter, but also our woody debris, like our fallen logs uh, and trees, we'll see, and they'll last for a little longer. So this may not really look like a rainforest. This isn't really something that we associate with a rainforest. Uh, you can see a couple of tree ferns at the bottom. What about this? This looks a little bit better. It's a little bit uh, less light coming in and a lot more of that uh, ferns and mosses and lichens that we associate with those wetter climates. This is just uh, down in a gully, but up on the top, we do have this big open uh, eucalypt. Forest. And this eucalypt forest is right on the border of our temperate rainforest. We see these in Victoria and we see these in Tasmania as well. Uh, and these are our beautiful giants, the eucalyptus regnans. I won't waffle on about them too much because I have spoken about them in another webinar if you want to check them out and talk all about eucalyptus. Um, but the other thing with rainforests is they don't like fire. So a lot of our Australian species are adapted to fire. But we start to come in this border where they start to repel fire and they don't want fire um, as part of the natural ecosystem. This is on that edge range. So this sort of dense eucalyptus forest would want to burn maybe once every 200 years, 250 years. Um, so really not often, but as soon as you lose any height, you move into a gully it switches into more of this classic temperate rainforest we see. So we have our epiphytes, which are one of our definitions. We have our dense canopy cover, uh, and we can see it is just an absolute host of life. This is almost a whole island of life in the edge of this broken tree. Um, so there's a lot of details that we see when we move through this, and it's also a great host for birds, so our bird life as well is absolutely extravagant. We have so many, I'd like to say the chorus of our birds, if you've heard of our Australian birds, they're a little bit screechy, they're a little bit loud. Uh, I still love them. Um, we see a lot of our parrots and cockatoos, as well as our smaller birds, our, our little songbirds, our robins, which aren't true robins, uh, and things like our, our golden whispers. So this is our eucalyptus regnans. Uh, they're very tall, regnans, regal, um, regent, uh, king of the forest, really. So they can reach over 100 meters tall. They are the tallest flowering plant in the world. We have a little bit of a feud with the redwoods on which is actually the tallest. Uh, and it just depends when you look at those records. We do have indications that eucalyptus regnans got a little bit taller. Um, the tallest at the moment was an uh, individual called Centurion, who was 102 meters tall. Uh, who just lost a limb in a recent storm. So it was only 99 points, I think. So still gets to be called Centurion. But these amazing giants have seen so much. Uh, the individuals live for hundreds of years. So you really feel that age as you move through this space. As soon as you descend down into the gully, we start to see things transform. We see a lot more of these tree ferns. These tree ferns have been around uh, throughout the Jurassic period. So they've seen the dinosaurs. And they're incredibly slow growing. Uh, they only grow a fraction of an inch every single year. And so if you look at it, uh, you see how many meters tall it is. You can rough estimate, depending on the conditions, but rough estimate every meter of growth is about 100 years of growth. So if we look at this one just behind uh, my lovely guest here, 
you can see that that could be a 300 year old tree quite easily. So you get to walk through these really beautiful ancient ecosystems and they're absolutely littered with so many other species. It really is quite magical and you kind of step, um, actually to quote my recent guests, I would say I, I feel like I stepped back in time and she mentions that she steps out of time when she walks through this space, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, so it really gives you this otherworldly sense that is a little bit different from how you might imagine your tropical rainforest and coming into this pool of climate. And it is quite cool here. So this is our golden whistler, one of the birds that I mentioned. Uh, we do see quite a few. It can be hard to catch uh, if they do like to flit around quite a lot. Uh, the golden whistler is a, a beautiful example of a whistler. Um, they have the most subspecies of any bird in the world, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, and they're just one of the few species that we see as we walk through this place. You're often uh, getting your neck a little bit warmed up as you're craning around, trying to see all of the details around you. This is my favorite tree. Uh, not that I have favorites, um, but this is one of our beautiful soft tree ferns that has been trying to follow the light and it's continued along as it just starts to pop up at the end now where the light is available heading upwards. But you can see a root that's running through it and that root actually continues up to a small sapling of a sassafras tree and so the base of these tree ferns act as a really good growing need. If anyone's a gardener or you may see these are often used to propagate orchids um, and things like that because they are just 100% organic material. The tree fern only grows from the top so if you were unfortunately to cut this tree in half and unfortunately I believe someone did sit on this and last time I went through it has fallen to the ground the tree will still continue to grow. So not all bad news there. I will miss this tree, but it will grow and continue its new life because of all of this growing medium, its roots can just drop straight down from wherever the head of the bit of the burn drops and it will continue to grow from there. The base of it won't grow. So different to if you were to cut a tree down and it would grow from the stump, this is gonna grow from the head instead. Um, so it will live on and it will keep keep monitoring its progress as we continue through. It's already starting to twist up towards the light, which uh, is, I always think, quite special to be able to see that change uh, as we move through, get a bit of history. With rainforest also comes waterfalls. And so this is one of our waterfalls in our temperate rainforest down in Tasmania. This is Russell Falls, and it's a beautiful multi-tiered waterfall. And the waterfalls here uh, always give you a little bit more of a sense of happiness. Uh, and there is a real reason to that. There's a reason that we sit by running water, whether it be uh, by the seaside or in a waterfall. And that's because as that waterfalls actually break up uh, the particles in the water and it creates a whole sense of uh, negative ions. So our hydrogen and our oxygen now floating around ready to attach. We get attachment sometimes of that oxygen to oxygen in the air, which makes ozone. We're basically getting a bit of an oxygen high from being around uh, these waterfalls. So you breathe it in, uh, it is shown to improve your mood. Um, and yeah, just give you that nice, really quite sense of fresh air because it really is. So the waterfalls here are uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful image of of the movement that's coming through here because we don't always see it when it's raining but there is always water moving underneath the ground so we'll see lots of little streams uh, and the, the ground will always contain some of that moisture and that I mean, these moisture dependent plants to continue to grow and as I was mentioning it's a little bit cooler here you may have seen some people wearing jackets and that's because as we move down into these temperate rainforests and especially as we move down to Tasmania Everything needs to adapt to this cooler climate. So I wanted to give you a classic example of one of our iconic Australian species. This is our lovely echidna. Uh, and have a look at the echidna on the left versus the two echidnas on the right. And you can see that the echidna on the left has really, really uh, prominent stains. It looks very glossy. It's quite mimicking the green form of it. And this is one of our mainland echidnas uh, that are found in a more hot environment. Uh, out in a more arid climate potentially 
And then we have our Tasmanian echidna on the neck. And you can see they still have their spines, but their fur is so much longer. And it's because it's cold down there. And so we're seeing these changes in all of our species, uh, as well as our plant species as they adapt to this cooler climate. Uh, it's just a really nice example to see. And still, still spiny, still careful when you pat them. Uh, but you can see just a huge transformation just based on a few degrees difference. So going further south, following our fuzzy fuzzy echidna, we come into this very cool climate, uh, temperate rain. You can see the understory looks a little bit different. It looks a little bit more open underneath. There's really not that much light coming through. We don't have this dense understory that we may see in some tropical rainforests. And this uh, rainforest in particular is a rainforest of the Nothophagus Cunninghamii, uh, which is a called a myrtle beach. Um, not the myrtle beach that we go swimming at, uh, it's the double E C H. Um, and you can see these really small jagged leaves uh, that are quite indicative of a beech tree. These beech trees have been found all across all of the continent that made up Gondwana. So all of the continent that made up our southern supercontinent uh, about 550 million years ago to 180 million years ago. So really together for, for a really big chunk of time there. And that's when we started to see that breakup and that tropical rainforest in Australia start to diminish. But this is a remnant of time when we see fossil records of these trees in Antarctica, and we see connections across to uh, the south of South America. And so we start to get to put this puzzle piece together from our fossil records of how all of these continents of Africa, Australia, India, and Antarctica, South America all linked up together. Um, and so this is a living fossil in that regard. This has been around for so long and it's given us so much understanding of the creation of our continents and how they have moved. And for that as well, the national parks in this area are part of a large world heritage area um, that has a huge variety of criteria for being listed as a world heritage. So there's 10 criteria you need to meet, um, one of them to be listed, and the Cradle Mountain Lake St. Clair area meets seven of them. One of them is understanding how our continents came in and that geological evidence as well underneath all of these species. So a lot of value here. Within this space, you can see this is the base of a myrtle beech tree and it just shows you some of the age and the slow decomposition. I always think this looks a little bit like a fairy garden or something like that. You can see the small leaves of the leaf litter are on the ground here um, and just show you how slow this environment is moving. Because it's cooler, decomposition is slower. And so things shift at a different pace of time to what we may experience. Um, and so we kind of have to shift our time frame a little bit into what these trees see. This is one of my guests, Sue, walking through this beautiful Myrtle Beach forest with some of our King Billy Pines on the side as well. They're the really, really straight ones. The King Billy Pines are, uh, have individuals that are 1,700 years old. So again, just showing you this really, really ancient landscape. We also have some beautiful critters here, of course. Uh, so this is a paddy melon. It is related to our wallabies and our kangaroos in that it's a macropod. Uh, and the paddy melons love to meander through the edge of this temperate rainforest. Uh, we see them hopping in and out. You have to be really quiet to hear them. They can be quite skittish, but if you're calm and you're patient, uh, you may be able to catch uh, quite a good shot of them as well. And we'll have a look at some framing on, on how to get a good photo. We're shooting in low light as well, so that's something to consider. Uh, but it's not just paddy melons out here. Down in Tasmania, we have our beautiful iconic Tasmanian devil. This Tasmanian devil, I will say, I did not shoot this uh, out in the wild. I wish uh, they are nocturnal. This is at one of our beautiful conservation um, uh, refuges that we visit at Cradle Mountain, which is devils at Cradle. Uh, and they're maintaining a stable devil population so that they can release them when it's safe to do so. Um, so at the moment, devils in the wild are faced with a disease, a facial tumor disease, which is an infectious cancer. 
Uh, and we are now starting to see a natural resistance in some of the populations, which is so exciting. Um, we're also developing a vaccine. So good news, watch this space in the next two to five years. Um, hopefully this little fella, um, their offspring will be able to go out into the wild. But we do have these devils. We have our quolls as well. These are carnivorous marsupials. So they serve as our carnivores in this ecosystem. And they can be quite at home in these cold environments. So you never know who might be lurking in those trees. It's also good to have a look really up close. This is some beautiful lichen and the lichen's actually fruiting at the moment. So lichen in the center here is a combination of fungi and algae. Uh, they work together in the most beautiful symbiotic relationship. And if you've been on any trips with usually a lot of polar bear guides, uh, you would have heard all of our puns about them taking a liking to each other. Uh, but here we can actually see the fruiting bodies. So because they're part fungi, that fungi has fruiting bodies and those fruiting bodies are mushrooms as we know them. And so the lichen will continue on its life cycle, um, but that fungi will still reproduce and uh, release spores. And so here, those little orange dots, you can see the fungi fruiting bodies. So when we get up close and personal, we can see a lot of details within this environment. And it can be a really amazing place to get uh, lost in and experiment around as well with some of the photography. So that brings me to just a few photography tips I wanted to give you. Nothing too in depth, but just you know, think about when you move through these spaces. Uh, just an idea when you go through pretty much any environment, um, but especially in these low light and these quite um, dense and detailed environments. So the first one, obviously, are lovely waterfalls. This is Russell Falls again, but from a little bit lower down. And this is just taken on my phone. And this is the same photo, but with a long exposure. And so you can see you get that classic streaky waterfall look. Um, that is so classic and just makes them look a lot more smooth and silvery um, and just a little less jagged than not using a long exposure. We can use these on our phones. Um, so I have a couple of little screenshots here um, of where to find some of these settings. So on your iPhone with photos uh, delivered from my brother, who's currently up in Abisko. Uh, <laughs> but you can see on the leftmost photo up in the top right corner, you can see a little symbol for live. And if you take a live photo and you hold really, really still, and then once you've taken that photo, you go to your gallery. That's the trick. This is not actually within the camera on a lot of iPhones. You take a live and then you go to your photo gallery. Then on the photo, you'll see an option up the top that says live. And if you click that, there's a drop down. And in that drop down is your long exposure. So you can get a long exposure like having a professional camera just from your iPhone. For those using an Android or a Pixel, it depends on the model. Uh, it depends where it is. They're often just written as a long exposure when you swipe across in your photo setting, or uh, it's sometimes under motion. And if you go to motion, then it might say slow-mo and it may say long exposure. Depends on your phone and if you search your model of phone with long exposure, there'll be lots of tutorials on how to find them. Uh, but it's something to bear in mind because you can get some really cool effects. For those who are shooting on cameras, we can get some even longer exposures. And this is a photo Matt took of the same waterfall and you can see what uh, keeping that shutter open for a lot longer can really give you. It gives you this real ethereal um, that's quite beautiful. The other thing that Matt has done here with this waterfall, you see I've sort of uh, a little bit higher in this photo, um, but you can see that Matt's gotten really low. Um, and if that's something you can do is drop down really low and make sure you get some of that foreground. That foreground gives you a lot more perspective for the waterfall, but gives you that smooth running water in the, in the front as well, which I think is a really nice contrast. So having a think about how you can position it. The other thing about getting down low is you can often stabilize it against the ground or against a railing. Uh, and then that's gonna give you a tripod without having a tripod. I like to credit myself with being able to find tripods in the weirdest of places, because often I've Got a lot of things on my back already uh, and so being able to lean your phone against something or prop it against something railings are really good for that the edge of a tree trunk uh, you can use your lens cap to prop up to get the right angle 
as much as possible because we really don't want to move it so that everything else stays really crispy and just the water is the movement that's pushing. The other thing is we're looking at low light. You can do this on your phone or your camera. Generally, your phone or camera is going to try and make things brighter because they assume you want to see everything. Normally, yes, that's true. But there's something about rainforests and low light environments that you still want to capture that moody aspect. So here, everything is quite bright. These are some beautiful turkey tail um, fungi that are growing out of a old log. And here is the same photo, but with less light. And so you can do this on your camera by uh, a number of things, whether you're changing your ISO or if you want to make your shutter speed uh, a little bit quicker so it's getting less light, um, as well as change your aperture. If you're on your phone, when you tap on your phone, it chooses your focal point. And usually when you tap that, there's a little sun icon that comes up on the side. And if you swipe that sun icon up or down, you can change how much brightness there is. You can also edit your photos after to reduce the brightness. And I would probably increase. But just by a simple change in the amount of light that you get through, it tells a very different story. By having it darker, you're just seeing the edge of those frills of those turkey tails. Uh, and you're getting more of that moody atmosphere that we associate with these low light environments. The other thing that we can look at is natural framing. This is one of our beautiful paddy melons again. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of framing with the trees. It's not as nice as it could be. If you have a subject that happens to be staying still, um, which is great with plants uh, and mushrooms, uh, but if you have a paddy melon who's sitting around, you can move around to try and see if there's a way that you can frame your subject. The other thing I just wanted to point out in this photo, the paddy melon's a little bit blurry, and that's because mainly the focal point is actually on this tree on the front in the foreground. And we'll see this a lot in a rainforest environment because there's often quite a lot of dense vegetation. It can be hard to get the thing that you want in focus in focus when your camera is on autofocus. So if you're on a camera, I would recommend experimenting with your spot focus. If you're on your phone, tap where you want the focus to be. And if you tap and hold, it'll lock it in place so you don't have to keep it. Um, so that way you can make sure that you're suggesting. But if we tighten up this natural framing, we can get a sense of this more dense environment and it gives us a very different picture. Uh, and so this is a young paddy melon. This is a paddy melon joey. And it's just caught in between two tree trunks. But we can also see there's trunks in the background and uh, the log that it's sitting on. It gives this really nice, natural and quite green frame to our paddy melon. So spending time and moving around, I'm often, you can see me taking a photo doing one of these ones, just scooching around, just to see what even shifting a few inches either side can do for the image. Um, I find rainforests are just such a nice way to play with this because there is so much to look at. And so I really urge you to look at the little things. Um, so this is a beautiful mushroom that's come up. We have over 2000 species of fungi in our temperate rainforest down in Tasmania. Uh, they range in every single color of the rainbow. They have the glow in the dark ones. It's absolutely incredible. There's everything. So have a look around. Don't be afraid to, to get low and have a look. This is a tiny orchid that would only be uh, a bit under an inch wide at its widest point. Uh, and they only flower for a few weeks every year. And there are a lot of different orchids within the day tree. We have nine species of orchid. They flower at various times throughout the year. So. If you're lucky and you keep your eyes peeled, you should be able to see something flowering. It's a nice thing about uh, our temperate rainforest as well. Uh, we don't have the seasonality necessarily. There's usually something that is flowering, um, which is always really, really good to look at. This is a lovely little spider web uh, on the edge of uh, a tree fern front. And I saw this uh, glint in the light and I definitely did one of these ones swaying back and forth. I would have looked like I was about to fall off my feet because I was trying to get that contrast behind. And when we take any photos of anything close, we need to think about what's behind it because that'll give us the most contrast and make our image pop. When we're up close, we can often just move a tiny bit and it will shift the background quite considerably. So here I wanted the fronds behind to also act as a bit of a frame, but also make sure that the web was really in a dark area so that I could see that image coming in as much as possible. So just spending a little bit of time swaying back and forth, 
just just go with it You're like in the breeze uh, light is also a really amazing feature in these low light environments they often make things pop out so much so this is a kangaroo fern um, and it's just having some sunlight peeking through and just by getting a little bit uh, low to the base of this trunk um, and getting it backlit in this way you can see it, it almost glows with the way that it is catching that light and similarly also a kangaroo fern but a little bit later this fall prints are absolutely beautiful. So just spend that time looking, looking at leaves, looking at details as you move through these spaces. Um, it's a really nice way to be mindful, but you'll be surprised at how much you see and how much uh, variety there is. Uh, this as well, uh, this is some beautiful drops on the edge of the tree, front, well, tree fern front. And when you're shooting up close, you don't want to get too close to the subject sometimes um, because it won't be in focus. Uh, often with our phones now, they actually have a physical zoom, not just a digital zoom, so you're not losing image quality. Uh, and for me, on this day, I only brought my long lens for wildlife. I was shooting birds mainly, but I saw this and I wanted to get a picture of it. And so with my 600 mil lens, I was standing about six, seven yards back trying to get enough distance that this was in my focal range. So sometimes taking a step back and zooming in a bit, you can still get the same effect as if you were having more of a macro style lens. Um, we still get some cool shots like this. So I hope uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea of how you can have a look at the details moving through the tropical rainforest. And just a couple of tips as you move through uh, with your photography as well as just experiencing it because there's so much wonder there. So thank you guys. All right. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thanks, now, Brad. of course, now before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question fields in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So, do you know how the Patty Mellon got its name? Uh, I do not. I feel like I looked this up about three weeks ago when I was there. Um, a lot of our names come from a uh, First Nation derivative name, so how it was recorded. Um, so like kangaroo comes from kangaroo, which means I don't understand what you're saying. Koala means uh, no water because they don't drink uh, very much at all. Um, but Paddy Mellon, I'm not sure on the entomology of. I would assume it's from somewhere nearby. Um, for me, I remember paddy melons because they are a lot rounder than wallabies. So I always say a paddy melon looks like a melon. So that's kind of my linguistic route for it. Um, but I'm not sure on that one. I'll have to look that one up. Gotcha. Thank you for that one. Um, let's see. So are the Tasmanian devils that are raised in captivity vaccinated uh, for the disease that is being uh, played by those in the wild right now? Uh, so the devils have quite a short lifespan. They only live about five years. Uh, and so they are just part of a breeding program with a bunch of different uh, conservation areas around Tasmania and Victoria and elsewhere in Australia um, to maintain genetic diversity, um, but they're not being released. So there's no need to vaccinate them because the disease is not introduced in, into those environments at all. They're safe from that. Um, it'll only be for devils that are released out into the wild. And so they're looking at how to implement that vaccination. Um, ideally, it would be through food and you could put out food that has it in it and then uh, the devils could eat that food because they are scavengers uh, and then be vaccinated against it. Um, but the devils who are in the program don't need to be vaccinated. We do go to Bunurong, um wildlife sanctuary and they are part of the trial so there's a couple of devils there that can never be released into the wild because of uh, injuries that they've sustained and they've been brought in for rehabilitation so they're going to be part of the trial um, to get that vaccine out and ready for the whole world and it's yeah it's really exciting because we'll see a lot more devils in Tasmania and maybe see them back on the mainland where they used to be. Excellent so is the Australian beach in the same family as the English beach, which seems really different. 
<laughs> no, they're not in the same family. It is a really common thing with a lot of Australian names because we had British come over um, that we have a thing, a lot of things that are named after Northern Hemisphere, particularly European species that are not related at all. They just sort of walked in and said, hey, that sort of looks maybe like this thing. I'm going to call it the same thing. So we see it with our eucalyptus regnans as well. Um, those big, tall eucalyptus trees, they're also called a mountain ash. They're not an ash. They're also called a Tasmanian oak. They're not an oak. Uh, so it is just a common thing for common names in Australia. So we do look at a li little bit more of the scientific names sometimes, um, but not related, not related to the beach. Great, thank you for clearing that up for us. Uh, so if I wanted to see uh, the Dan tree, can I do that on an AdHab tour? You sure can, yeah. Uh, the ultimate trip uh, goes to the Dan tree as well as the temperate rainforests. And so you start up in Cairns and you go up to the Dan tree as well as Appleton Tablelands, you're on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and then you make your way all the way down to Tasmania. You go across to Mariah Island, absolutely beautiful, and a uh, disease-free population of devils, actually, which is great. Uh, you continue through a full Tasmanian itinerary, similar to the southern trip, and then you duck up into uh, the southern outback. So you go to the Ikara Ranges or the Flinders Ranges. You see a taste of the outback there, and then you go down to Kangaroo Island, and then finish in Adelaide. So it's a huge tour. You see so many different ecosystems, absolutely amazing. Um, and you really get the full highlight reel with minimal travel because we, we get you to where you need to go as soon as we can. And so, yeah, the ultimate would be the one to see the day. Great. What, what about the Myrtle Beach tree? Myrtle Beach, also in the ultimate, but also in the Southern itinerary. So the Southern itinerary does um, a fair chunk of the ultimate, you don't go up north, you start in Adelaide and kind of going backwards, we go to uh, Kangaroo Island. And then this year we go to the Great Ocean Road and next year we'll be going to the Grampians, which are both on the mainland in Victoria. And then we go down to Tasmania and Tasmania is where we see the, the largest collection of these beech trees, the metal beech trees, um, as well as our devils and our paddy wallets and our wombats and our kidna and our platypus and our everything, everything. Um, Tasmania really is a haven for a lot of wildlife. Um, yeah, so that's, that's both of the Australian itineraries will get you to a Myrtle Beach, no worries. Great to know that too. So um, what about, uh, what is the climate and in the, in the temperature and the location with the tree kangaroos? The uh, climate in the Dane tree does vary. Uh, it has more of a wet dry season rather than your typical seasons because we're coming into the subtropics, tropics region. Um, so we really have more of a rainy season and then a more dry season. The temperatures can fluctuate in the summers. We can get really hot days that are over 100 degrees. Uh, they're not as common. And when you get into the shelter of the rain tree, uh, the rainforest, uh, it gets a little bit cooler, which is good, but it's quite humid uh, during that wet season, as you can imagine, as with any rainforest uh, in the tropics. And then in the winter, it gets cool. It doesn't get cold. Uh, yeah, you, a light sweater often. Sometimes you do get a cold front through, but it really is more about that rain. So we're looking at a more wet season and a more dry season. All right, thank you so much, Nikki. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for your closing comments. Thanks, Rob. And thank you all for joining in. I hope you found this interesting and a little bit more of a deeper dive into some of the unique films of Australia. Uh, and you can catch me next week for an overview of the Southern itinerary for Australia in 2025. Uh, and then in March, I'm going to continue this series of Biomes of Australia. I'm going to look at some of the Alpine regions. They'll look a little bit different too. So thanks, guys. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out.
Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.